All right, and the topic for the sermon this morning. And actually, if you wouldn't mind, please keep your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be coming right back to here, but Romans 14 is where I'm going to want you right now. So keep, keep a bookmark in 2 Corinthians 5. We're coming right back, but turn, if you would, to Romans 14. And what, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the judgment seat of Christ. There's a lot of, of misunderstandings and people don't necessarily have even, a lot of people might not have even ever thought about it before. What is the judgment seat of Christ? Um, we're going to go into this in a lot of detail. And really there's only a few places where, where in the Bible where the judgment seat of Christ is specifically mentioned as the judgment seat of Christ. There's many other places that, that give us um, some extra information about it, but not referring to it specifically as a judgment seat of Christ. But we're going to see um, what the Bible's talking about, what we can expect, and, and what the Bible's teaching about this topic. Now, I want to start off just by stating, um, you know, it's not our job as Christians to be standing in judgment of our brothers in Christ. Now, um, Oftentimes, or, or sometimes, maybe there will be a situation where, where a brother or sister in Christ will be in need of correction. And we do so in love and in humility and try to, try to help that person out, you know, um, and, and point some things out. But, it, but it's not, a, it's not a being in judgment of them as much as it is a correction and a help, if that makes sense. Um, we don't need to be saying in judgment of our brothers in Christ because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to see that here in Romans chapter 14. If you look down in your Bibles in Romans 14, in verse number 8, it explains this very concept. Romans 14, 8 reads, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So here we're seeing, you know, the Bible is saying, look, we're all going to have to give account of ourself to God. You, you aren't the judge over your brother in Christ. You don't need to be standing in judgment of them. He already has a judge. And so do you. You have a judge also. So... The, the judging attitude over your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church is one oftentimes that will lead to, to a feeling of superiority and, and, and even bitterness against other people. And that's why I said, you know, sometimes correction may be necessary. Someone's in, in, in error. Someone's in sin. And hey, the, the whole point of, of coming together as a church family is to, is to help each other out and look on one another and say, hey, you know, and, and not just to condemn and judge, because that's what the judges do, is condemning them as much as just saying, you know, the scripture says we, you know, we ought to be doing this. And you do that in a certain way, in a tactful way, and not in a way where you're just, you know, coming down on them necessarily. Now, obviously, it depends on, on the grievousness of the sin. I mean, if, if someone's in, in, a, in a wicked, wicked sin that, like, the Bible says we shouldn't even fellowship with them, then yeah, you know what, that's going to require a different level of, of um, the way that you deal with them. You know, not to eat with them. And, and, you know, a person like that will typically be handled by the pastor anyways within the church um, with them not being allowed to, to, to congregate anymore while they're still in those specific sins. But I digress. I don't want to get too far into that because um, the Bible saying here is that, look, the things that we do, that the work that we're doing for, for God and the work that we're doing in our lives and the things that we're doing, we're going to, you know, we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we don't need to be standing in judgment of anybody else. Now, 
That being said, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I just wanted to bring it up. That's my first point. It's kind of a smaller point. I want to get more in depth on what the, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be all about, though. This is one of the references in Romans 14 that we just read that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So the first thing to remember is that, look, we're all going to be there. So basically it's saying, worry about yourself. You know, get yourself right. Do your things. Um, don't be so caught up in what everybody else is doing. You know, kind of, you know, I want to say mind your own business. In a way, yes, mind your own business. Obviously, we, we need to look out for each other, but there's a way to look out for each other and still be able to mind your own business. But um, we're, we're all going to have our, our opportunity before the judgment seat of Christ. So we need to be focused on getting ourselves right and doing the things that we need to do for ourselves and not to be standing in judgment of everybody else. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where we started. Romans 14, we're done. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse number 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, just a real quick note on this verse. This is one of the reasons why I want to point out you know, some people believe that there's purgatory. Some people believe that there's this thing called soul sleep where when a person dies, they're basically just asleep in the ground. But right here we can see that basically when you're absent from your body, you know, you're present with the Lord. It's, a, it's something that happens right away. There is no um, uh, in-between stage. There is no purgatory. There is no, no holding place. There is no sleep. Uh, uh, you know, where, where you pass away and then there's nothing for a while and then, you know, because some people think, well, uh, once Jesus comes back, then we're going to wake up and it's like, no. Um, that resurrection is a bodily resurrection, but when you, when you pass away, when you're absent from your body, and that's how the Bible defines death, by the way, um, the, the soul without the body is, the, the body's dead. Um, he says here in verse 8, we are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Uh, verse number 9, he says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now, one of the big points I want to clear up about this event is that this is not talking about being punished for your sins. This is not that type of a judgment. He's talking to believers. The judgment seat of Christ, and I'll be able to prove this in a little bit, we'll see when that actually takes place and who is involved. The people who are involved at the judgment seat of Christ are all saved believers in Jesus Christ already. So, when we read what this is saying here, it says um, that wherefore we labor, so we work, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. This is not referring to our salvation. And obviously it can't be talking to our, about our salvation because it says we're working. If it was talking about our salvation, then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 would be false. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation does not come as a result of our works. So when it talks about being accepted of him, this isn't referring to your eternal salvation, but this is the type of verse that someone who believes in work salvation would like to apply that way. But then you have other contradictions. We know that we are saved completely by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with our good works. So then you say, well, what does this mean that we may be accepted of him? Well, think about it this way. And again, I, I love this example so much because it fits all throughout scripture. An example of a father and, his, and their children. You know, my children are my children no matter what. Whether they listen to me, whether they obey me, disobey me, they're, all, they're my children. They were born into my family. They're my children forever. But a child oftentimes will look to gain acceptance 
from their father, right? They want their father to be pleased and to be accepted and be able to found worthy of being able to be called their son or their daughter. This is the same type of acceptance that we are looking for when we labor and we work. We want to be able to go to God and say, God, look at all this work that I've done for you. And we want God to be happy with our work. That is the acceptance that we're looking for. It's not the acceptance into heaven. It's not the acceptance of, just, of, of our salvation. We already have that. This is something more. This is something on top of that. And this is what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. God is going to look at everything that we've done of all of our works and he's going to analyze it and say, this is what you did that truly mattered with your life. And this stuff didn't matter at all. Now, there's some words in here that people will, will can get confused about and will throw you off a little bit. Um, in verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. So, right, so this is talking about we are going to get, you know, rewards based on what we've done in our body, right? The things that we've done on this earth in our body, we're going to receive. It says, According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, remember that phrase because we're, the, the next scripture I'm going to go to. I'm going to go to another place and then I'm going to cover the whole good or bad thing. Okay. But keep that in mind just that, that it says here that we're going to receive for what we've done in our body, whether it's good or bad. Okay. And it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but are made, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now, this judgment, I just want to make this clear as well. It's a different judgment that the unbelievers will face because this is, this is all the believers. And turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. We're done in 2 Corinthians 5, Matthew 16. I'm going to read for you from Matthew 12. You're going to Matthew 16. See, there's, there's two judgments and we don't want to confuse the two. One of the judgments is found in Revelation chapter 20. And that's at the, the, the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment happens basically after everything. So we're going to have, you know, the next thing that we're looking for is the Antichrist to come into power. And there's going to be the tribulation. And then Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rapture up the saints and God's going to pour his wrath out on the world. Jesus is going to set up his millennial kingdom, his reign on this earth for a thousand years. And then there's that great final battle where Satan's going to round everyone up. After the end of that thousand years, he's going to be loosed out of hell. And then Jesus is going to destroy the devil and everybody else that's following him. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay. So at, this, at the point right before the new heaven and the new earth, is this great white throne judgment. And this is where hell is relocated from the center of the earth into the lake of fire, which is like the outer darkness. And I'll read for you real briefly from Revelation 20 because in, uh, in verse 11 of Revelation 20, it says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God. Now I want to point out, when this is talking about the dead, this isn't referring to saved people. Saved people are, are always referred to as being alive. Right? We have everlasting life. So we, even if our body passes away, we're not dead. Right? We're not considered dead. This is talking about the dead because people who don't have eternal life are dead. Now they exist. It's not that they cease to exist. Their soul continues on, but their soul is considered dead. Just as much as we're considered alive, they're considered dead. But it doesn't mean that they, they don't experience things. So it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. 
This is the judgment that people who go to hell will face at that great white throne where they'll finally realize and understand, look, you didn't receive the free gift of salvation, so now you are going to be judged based on the works that you did in this life. And you think about all the sins, all the commandments that God has, you say, well, you broke this commandment, you broke this commandment, you did this, 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 you did this. You did this. And it's not a good punishment. That's, what the, that's all they have to bring to God. They'll say, oh, but, but, I, uh, but I did whatever. I mean, whatever they could come up with that they said that they did. I went to church every week. But you didn't receive the free gift. Your sins aren't forgiven. So, okay, you went to church every week, but you did all these sins, and the punishment for your sins is hell. That's the great white throne judgment. But not, that's not a place where any of the believers are going to be. That's where the dead are standing before God and they're judged according to their works. Now, we have a judgment according to our works, but it's, not, it's a completely separate judgment. Completely separate. So when you read verses like is in Matthew 12, we can't confuse the judgment seat of Christ with this great white throne judgment of the lost. In Matthew 12, verse 36, the Bible reads, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. This is referring to that judgment. Look, by your words, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Every idle word. People who in this world, when you're, when you're lost and you say stupid things and you, you know, blaspheme God and all this other stuff, those words are all going to come back to remembrance on Judgment Day at that great white throne judgment. But this, I do not believe this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Here's why. The reason why is because God has separated us from our sin when we got saved. A lot of people will teach that at the judgment seat of Christ, you are going to be standing before God and He's going to like play a movie of all the, all the things that you've done and all the bad things and, and you're going to have to give account for everything that you've done that's wicked and bad and wrong. People teach this, but it's false. It's not true. because And, and they'll use verses like the one I just read for you in Matthew 12. It says, you know, every idle word. You know, make sure you give account for every idle word. That's a different judgment. That's not the judgment seat of Christ. Why in the world, and, and just think about this logically for a minute. If God has separated us from our sin, in Hebrews 10, the Bible says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He says, I'm not even going to remember your sins anymore. He says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Our sins are completely washed away and, 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 and forgiven and done away with. So why would he be, bring, you know, especially at the judgment seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, we've already passed away from this earth. It's not like we're still living on this earth. You know, when God disciplines us, it's to correct us that we could change and do what's right. You know, that would be the, the purpose of us being disciplined or corrected in this life. So if we sin in this life, you know, God might come down on us and discipline us, but it's because we still have the opportunity to get right. Once we've passed on, we don't have the sinful flesh anymore. And the Bible's clear that, you know, it's this flesh that's 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 causing us to sin. Our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our spirit is what wants to do what's well. Hey, when this sinful flesh is gone, we don't have any of those sinful urges anymore. We're going to be standing before God in our spirit. That sin is removed from us. So why in the world would God, once that sinful flesh is gone, be, be bringing up and rehashing all of our sins to us that we've already been forgiven for. It just doesn't make any sense. That is not what the Bible is referring to. It's not what the Bible is talking about when we're going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Look at, um, you're in Matthew, did I, are you in Matthew 16? Yes. Matthew 16. Um, 
Verse 24, the Bible reads, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So this judgment seat of Christ where he's rewarding people according to their works, the, you know, the, the disciples, because he says in 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, right? If any man will come after me. So he's saying, if you're going to follow me, you need to pick up your cross, you need to work hard, you know. And then he says, because the Son of Man is going to come. He says, I'm going to come in the glory of his, of his Father with the angels. And then he shall reward every man according. So this, this gives us that timeline of when this actually happened. The judgment of Christ happens after the rapture. After Jesus Christ comes back with the angels and, and we get transfigured, new bodies, we're raptured up to heaven or up to, up to meet Jesus in the air. That is when he comes and will give his judgment. Because some of the things that he, that he gives, also this is before he reigns for a thousand years on the earth, some of the things that he gives is, is ruling and reigning with him and different people are given, you know, you reign over this many cities, you reign over that many cities, you know, these are some of the rewards that are given unto, unto us, unto the, unto the believers. So it has to happen before that, that thousand year reign of Christ on earth because he's, he's giving out those, um, I'll deal with all questions after service, but this is, this is that time frame. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So this is, this is when this judgment is going to happen. It's when Jesus comes back, as according to, to Matthew 16 that we just read there. <clears throat> Now, this is a judgment based on our works, but it's not a judgment of our salvation. And that's the main thing that you need to, to get across about this judgment. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to see another reference here in Scripture to the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. The Bible reads, So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so is by fire. So what he's explaining here, he's, he's, he's saying, okay, look, when you're doing your work, he's likening this to a building, to building stuff, to literally like physically building stuff. He says, okay, first of all, there's no other foundation than Jesus Christ. If you're going to build anything, you know, you need that foundation of Jesus Christ. That's our salvation. That's, that's putting up faith in Christ. You need to be saved in order to receive any rewards, in order to do anything for God, in order to build anything, in order to receive any rewards from God. First, you need that foundation already laid. And he's saying, though, here, he's saying also, now look, 
other people can build on that foundation. Just as you were saying earlier, you know, it's about him and a policy saying, look, you know, one guy sows, another guy waters, another guy plows. God gives the increase and another person reaps. Now, all of those laborers are all working together for that same goal. And in that case of getting somebody saved, of reaping that harvest. But not only that, you know, people are also working and striving and laboring with other Christians and discipling people and teaching and instructing and trying to help them to grow and become a better and stronger Christian themselves. So the foundation is Jesus Christ. You need to have that laid, but then you build upon that. And even individual in your own life, the works that you do, obviously if you don't have a foundation, you have nothing. If you're not saved, you're not going to have anything to build on. But he says to take heed how you build on that, what you are building. So in your life, you have the foundation already laid of Jesus Christ because you're saved. That's already there. Now, what are you building on that foundation? You're saved, yes, but what are you, lit what are you really doing with your life? What are you building? And what he's explaining here is that all the things that you do, all the work, all the effort, everything you do for your entire life that's, that, that came after you you have that foundation of Christ that was laid after the, your moment of salvation there, you, we're, we're all doing things with our life everybody's doing something some more than others but we're all doing something we put all that work whatever you've been doing on top of that foundation of Christ what he's saying here is that at the judgment seat that when, it, when it's time for rewards to be given he says in verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In the, in the previous verse, it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Those are the six things he lays out. He says, look, you know, people, some people are putting you got a bunch of wood, we've got a bunch of hay, we've got some precious stones in there, we've got some gold, we've got some silver. Now, the first three things, the gold, silver, and precious stones, if you, if you put those in a fire, they're not just going to get burned up, right? They're going to remain through the fire. They're going to still be around after the fire is gone. But the wood, hay, and stubble, man, that stuff gets burned up right away. That, and, and basically what it's showing us and teaching us here is that there are things that you can do in your life that have eternal value. The gold, the silver, the precious stones that God looks at that and says, yeah, you really did something for me. But then there's a lot of other things that you can do with your life, work, labor, that's considered wood, hay, and stubble. And that stuff just gets burned right up. Now think about this. You can work, there, there are people out there that work very, very hard in their life. I mean, you know, over 100 plus hour work weeks to build a great business, for example. Right? Let's say you are, what, what's, a, what's Walmart's, what's the guy's name, the, the, the founder of Walmart? Wal, I forget, I forget, I forget the guy's name. But look, the guy built this empire, right, of, of all these stores and this great chain and, and all this stuff. I'm sure that didn't just fall into his lap. I'm sure he worked very, very, very hard to get to things the way they are now. And I don't know if he still owns it or whatever, but look, it doesn't matter for this example. Let's just use him as an example and say he owns all that stuff. How much do you think God is going to care that he established such a great successful business and made a ton of money. Do you think that God is going to really look at that and have respect unto that work and say, wow, you built this great, you made all this money and this fortune and everything on earth. So now I'm going to give you even more rewards in heaven because you've worked so hard and did all this effort for that. No. God doesn't care for money. And in fact, God tells us, you know, um, in Matthew 6, 19, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there are things that we can do 
that God considers to be gold, silver, and precious stones, things that if you were to put those in a fire to get tested, to be tried, to say, how good is what you did really? Then it'll abide that fire and, and it's still left over and says, well, here, this is everything you did. Now, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ. They ought not be, but they probably will be thinking that, well, I've done so much for Jesus. I've done, I've lived such a good life. But have you really? And you have to think about this for yourself. What have you really done that you can say is of eternal value, that's lasting value, that, that is something that, that, you can, that God can look at and say, here's something that you worked for, that you did. Because it's, it's labor. I mean, we're talking about being judged on our works, on our efforts. This is not just on your overall mood or how you talk to people or are you really nice, right? This isn't how, well, I'm not judging anybody. I'm not just, look, that doesn't earn you rewards. That's not actually going out and working and doing something for God. That's just, or, or even just, even keeping yourself from sin. Or you say, well, look, I don't drink. I don't watch movies. I don't do this. I don't do that. I can you know, start listening up. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I, you know, like, like I, don't, I don't commit fornication. I, you know, all these things. I'm keeping myself pure. Yeah, but what work are you producing for God? Now look, it's good not to sin, but not doing something that's wrong doesn't earn you a reward. That's expected of you. That's saying, look, you're going to receive a punishment if you do these things. It's not, if you don't do these things, you're going to get a reward. No, you've got it backwards. <laughs> you better not do these things or else you get punished. So don't think that be, even if you live the most righteous, pure life as far as keeping yourself from sin, hey, that's not earning you rewards. You need to work and labor and do something for God in order to, re to receive rewards. That's what a reward is. And it's, it, it, ultimately, it, it's going to be our good works that we're rewarded on and the good works that have lasting value. And what I love about this is, is, is the, you know, the, the, perfection in God's word and his plan. Now, our salvation is completely free. It's a free gift. And it's so free that God makes very clear to distinguish that any of the good works that you do, he's going to reward you for that so that you don't even think, well, some of my good works had any part of this salvation. No, because you're getting paid for those good works separately that, that transaction of your, of your free gift, completely separate from anything good that you do for God. Two completely different things. You get rewarded for the good things that you do, for the good works that you do for God, whereas salvation was just a free gift. But, um, okay, turn if you would to Leviticus chapter 27, because now I want to explain, because people still get confused about, well, wait a minute. If it says we're going to be, and I'll read it for you again. We, we already had turned away from there. But it says, Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Bersons. You said that you know, God's already separated us from our sin. right? And, it's, and this is a judgment where we're receiving rewards based on the good things that we do. So why does it say that he, you know, whether, whether the works are good or bad? How can it be bad? Doesn't that mean that it's something sinful? No. Now, a little bit of evidence we just saw in 1 Corinthians 3 where we read, when our work is actually tried, it said gold, silver, precious stones, but then it said wood, hay, and stubble. Now, is there anything sinful or wicked about wood, hay, and stubble? No. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sin. Just like I said, I mean, um, you know, building a great business for yourself, doing any other type of work with your life, it doesn't mean that you're sinning. You've just done something and invested a lot of time and resources into something that has no eternal value. It's just going to be burned up. But it doesn't mean that you were in sin when you did that. It doesn't mean that you were just you were breaking God's commandments. And it's going to be the same thing with us being judged of whether we did good or bad 
It's the understanding of that word bad. And we're going to get a, a pretty good understanding of what bad means in Leviticus 27. That's why I had you turn there. Leviticus 27, verse number 9. We'll start reading. Leviticus 27, 9. And I want you to see this for yourself because, you know, a lot of people will like to take scriptures and say, oh, well, this doesn't really mean this. This means something else. And just try to change the meaning of a word because they're, whatever they're trying, they're trying to make it fit their teaching. Right? And it would be easy for me to say, oh, well, bad just does, it doesn't mean sin. Right? But if I don't give you the evidence and, and, and show you why, then, you know, I'm lacking. And I want you to see this from you know, the Bible uses that word bad. It's not just talking about, it's not talking about sin necessarily. Now, it's possible it could be, but we already, for one, we're able to con compare 1 Corinthians 3 with 2 Corinthians 5 about, um, you know, our works being tried and, the, you know, the, the, the wood, hay, and stubble. Those aren't necessarily, you know, what we would consider bad as being evil or wicked. But look in Leviticus 27 verse 9. The Bible says, And if it be a beast, whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. So he's talking about an offering that people give unto God, an animal sacrifice. He's saying it needs to be holy. Okay? Verse 10. He shall not alter it, nor change it, a good for a bad, or a bad for a good. And if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest, and the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou valuest it, who art the priest, so shall it be. So, the good and bad is talking about the value of the, you know, in this case, it's a beast. So an ox or some other beast or some beast that you want to give as a burnt sacrifice unto God, is that beast, you know, if you said that beast is bad in this context, is that talk, I mean it's sinful or that it's doing wickedness or that it killed people? No, that's not what it means when it says bad. It's just talking about the value of the beast. So let's say, well, this beast is bad because it's, it had a broken bone, because it's, you know, there's, there's a flaws with it, there's, there's something wrong with it, but it's not, um, it's not evil, it's not wicked, it's just bad. It's just, well, this is good, this is bad, you know, I don't, I don't want to, um, you're valuing it. It's the same way with our works, the things that we work for, the things that we do being presented for, before God, look, you can do works that are considered bad because they don't have much value because it's wood, hay, and stubble. There's not much value to that. If I were to put a stick on the pulpit over here and a, and a gold nugget over here, right? If you're going to value those, what are you going to say? Well, I want that one. Why do you want that one? That one's good. I want that. That one holds value. The stick doesn't hold any value. You throw that in a campfire, but then it's gone, right? That's about as much value as you can get out of that stick. It's going to provide you some temporary warmth and pff, done. Whereas the gold, you can do a lot more with that and, and it retains a value as a much higher value, much higher price. The, it's the same way with our works. So that's why it says in, um, in the other uh, chapter that we read, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, that we're going to receive for the things that we've done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. The bad is just things that don't have much value or any value. And the good is the stuff that's going to abide the fire that has eternal value. So now let's get into, well, what can we do? How do we earn rewards? And after we go through a lot of this stuff, you have to, to ask yourself again at the end of the service, how many rewards do I think I'm going to, am I going to get rewards? When I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, did I really do the work and the labor that I thought I did? Or am I going to have everything that I've done just burnt up? Now, the biggest thing that we can do, and one that without doubt will earn us rewards, is 
soul winning is winning other people to Christ. The impact that you have on their life. And turn if you would to um, turn if you would to Matthew. No, no, no. Yeah, turn if you would to Matthew six. We'll spend some time in the Gospels in a little bit. But um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9.16, it says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For a necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So he's saying, look, preaching the gospel... There's a reward associated with that. And the reason why is because when you change, you, when you can preach Jesus to somebody, and as a result of you preaching God's word to them, they put their faith and trust on Jesus Christ to save them, you have changed their life forever. That has eternal value. That person who was destined toward, towards hell because they're a sinner now is going to be in heaven with Christ forever. That has eternal value. That has lasting value. That is something that abides. That is something that God can look at. And that's why it said, you know, I, I forgot to, to bring this up. It said that we're God's husbandry. We are God's workmen. You know, he, he uses us. He plows with us. And yeah, it says, there it is in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. It says, for we are laborers together with God. God works with us. He gives us the Holy Spirit and he works with us. He says, ye are God's husbandry. You know, you're his workhorse. You're God's animal to do, to do a lot of um, grueling work. He says, you are God's building. God uses us to do this work just as God uses us to get people saved. God uses us to be his ambassador and, and to reconcile people unto God. That has lasting value for sure. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, I know you're still in Matthew 6, but um, I'm just going to read some of these verses for you. The Bible reads, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? So, we're, you know, some rewards would be crowns, right? But what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Other believers, other people that you've gotten saved are your hope, joy, and crown of rejoicing. At, at, at the, and it says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Because that's when the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place is at his coming. A soul converted to Christ is of eternal value. And I could go on and on and on about with the verses about soul winning and how important it is. But I want to get into, because I think that's pretty obvious, I'm going to get into a few other areas that the Bible talks about earning rewards for yourself. Um, Proverbs 11, 18, 18 says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Again, sowing righteousness. It's, that's, it, you know, and in many cases, sowing is like preaching God's word, right? If you sow the seed, the seed is God's word. To him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. But, um, actually, I have you in Matthew 6. Well, okay, I'll read Matthew 6 and we'll jump back to Matthew 5. I thought I had read this earlier, but I didn't. So Matthew 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now, first of all, alms in the Bible, it's not talking about your tithe. The tithe is something that belongs to God. Tithe is a 10% of your increase, and I believe in that. I preach sermons about that. But alms are different. Alms are something that you give to somebody or whether it be to church or to somebody, you know, there was a, a, a story in the Bible where there was a man sitting outside of the temple asking for alms. You know, people who were, who were disabled, who aren't able to work, and they're asking for charity, they're asking for help from people, they're asking 
alms of them. It's, it's, a, it's basically like a charity, right? So this is something above and beyond. This is something extra that you do. Now, what he's saying is that, look, and you think about the big names, think about the Bill Gates and, and all these other people, you know, these great philanthropists, and they have this big, the big deal, televised event, and, and it's in the newspapers whenever they give a bunch of money to some, you know, African colony or whatever it is, whatever they're, they're given their support for. There's always this big press, this big media about it, because do you think they really care about those people? No. It's publicity stunt, they're getting tax breaks, they're doing all these other things out of it, but it's not, it's not because they care about it and they sound the big trumpet and they want everybody to know, look at how great of a person I am. I just gave all this money to help these people. Look, when you give to someone, don't do that. Don't go around telling everybody how much money you gave to this organization, how much you gave to this people and how you saw this, oh, man, I saw this guy, he needed so much help and I hooked him up, I did this, I did that because God says, okay, well, you've got your reward then. You want glory and praise of men by telling other people how great you are? There you go. Then you've got your reward. But if you can just do these things out of the kindness of your heart, he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You want to give those alms and give those alms? God will see that. No one else has to see that, but God sees those things and he'll reward thee openly. Flip back one chapter to Matthew 5. We want to earn rewards. We want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be able to have something to show for our entire life and our existence on this earth. What was your life worth? What did you do? Matthew 5 verse 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. When you're getting, when, and it says for righteousness sake, when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when you get persecuted because you are not backing down, you are standing on God's word, you're proclaiming God's word and saying, thus saith the Lord, and people come out and they attack you and they, they, they make up lies about you and they slander you, they revile you, they persecute you, they say all manner of evil against you falsely. For, for Jesus Christ's sake, he says, hey, be happy about that. Don't let that get you down. Don't worry about what the heathen is raging about and, and attacking you for. He says, great is your reward in heaven. Don't let the persecution get you out of serving God because that's the whole point of it. That's why Satan wants to attack you is because he wants you to get out of the fight. Because yes, it is a spiritual fight. It's a spiritual battle. But if you can stay, stay strong and actually be doing enough to get noticed to where people are going to attack you. Because again, this isn't like everybody getting persecuted and reviled and people just lying about them. That doesn't happen to every Christian. Let's face it. There's a lot of people that are saved that never experience anything like this at all. And it's because they're not doing that type of work and having that type of voice and, and, and actually standing up and saying these different things. Now look, they may believe those things, but if you're not doing and, and saying and acting, you know, that's, that's where you're going to receive these rewards is by not backing down because these things will come and you will be persecuted if you're living a righteous and godly life. Now let's turn to Luke 14. I've got two places. Actually, you know what? Stay in Matthew because I'm, I'm going to blow through Luke 14. The last place we're going to go is Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is my, that's, that'll be the last place we turn to. I'll read for you from Luke 14, verse 12. The Bible reads, Then said he also to them that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed 
at the resurrection of the just. Talking about receiving a reward at the judgment seat of Christ, this specifically says you will be repaid at that resurrection of the just. The just is the same. When Jesus Christ comes back at that judgment seat, you will be re receive a reward. You will be recompensed for what you've done. He's saying, look, when you make a feast, help the people that aren't going to be able to pay you back. He's saying, you know, what good is it to, to you know, if you're going to be putting on this great feast and you're going to, you know, you're going to buy all this food, you're going to do all this stuff and you're going to have this big party, you're going to invite people over. Well, if you're just inviting other people who are going to do the same thing next month, except they're going to invite you over, you know, that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinful, but that, that's not going to earn your reward. But if you're going to take your time and your energy and your money and your resources and you're going to put together some food and you have a feast, he says, hey, get the, the widows, the fatherless, the maimed, the blind, those people who, who can't help themselves, who have no means of taking care of themselves, go out and help them. The lame, the blind, the maimed, the poor. They can't pay you back. You're not going to be waiting for them to throw the next party. You're doing it out of charity, out of love for them. God says, I see what you're doing, and I like that. I like that you're looking out for these people, these less fortunate people who don't have things, that don't have the resources. You're helping them out. You're going to get yourself, God will repay you. No other, you, know, you don't have to worry about man repaying and you getting a bunch of wealth and money on this earth because that's all going to burn up anyways. God says, I will recompense you. I see what you're doing, and I like that. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We're going to start reading in... Verse number 14. <coughs> There's a lot of scripture regarding the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Um, this is going to be Christ's kingdom that he sets up. So, we want to know more about that and about earning rewards and about being set over different cities and things like that. We can learn a lot from this scripture because we're, I'm kind of running out of time, but this is the last place I'm going to look at is Matthew 25. we we'll start reading in verse 14. The Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Remind you of being accepted of Christ, right? Him saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's keep reading. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art an hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went, and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. 
His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall ye say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And uh, kind of a lot of scripture we just read. But this is obviously a parable, right? So we need to be careful the way we understand things and, and, and um, you know, interpret parables, obviously with, with, with all parables. But basically the point that, that we could bring across from these parables is, you know, God has given you talents, and, and here a talent is like gold or money, right? It's, it's amount of money where you go and trade and make more money with. But we could even just use this. God has given you your own personal abilities and your own talents and your own things to work with. And he expects you to take those abilities to work for him and to gain others. And I think, that, again, the biggest way to earn rewards, in my opinion, is to win other people to Christ. Because I think that's, that's what we're here to do. You know, you are, you are basically, you see these people, they're doubling up on what they've been given. You're saying, well, you gave me five, I, mean, I gained five others. You gave me two, I gained two others. You know, you're, you're using your abilities, whatever God has given you, to, to reproduce and to bring more uh, back in again. And the last point I want to, I want to go into is, you know, at the end of the chapter here, When, he, when God separates the, the goats from his sheep on the left and right. Now, obviously, the goats are unsaved and the sheep are saved, right? So he separates them. And he says to the sheep, you know, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Look, you, you get this inheritance. You receive this reward because you're saved, for one. But then he says, For I was in hunger and he gave me meat. And, if, and this is a list that I think you can look at of things that you can do that will also earn yourself a reward. That will also earn you a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. You know, you're hospitable, you're, you're, you're feeding the hungry, you're giving drink to the thirsty. You know, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. And they answer him, they're saying, well, Lord, like, when did we ever see you, you know, all these things? We didn't do all these things to you. When did that happen? He said, and as much as you did unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. God takes special care for the people who are, have it, you know, who are down and out. The people who don't have things as well. God looks at the fathers. He looks at the widows. He looks at the maimed and the poor and the blind and the people who don't have things so well. 
And because a lot of people are really wicked and will just use and abuse those people and trample over them. But God looks at the people who are in those positions that aren't able to, 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 to help themselves or do things for themselves, and God takes special care for them. So when he sees you doing that work and looking out for those people, God will reward you for that. Because you're doing that out of love, out of your heart, to look after people and to, and to help them in their time of need. We all have our times of need. And God will be there to help you through your time of need, but he also likes to see you going and helping other people in their times of need. So hopefully this helped clear up a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ, you know, the things that you might be able to do to earn rewards, to, and understand just that, you know, God's not going to be, you know, you don't have to be in fear of, of judgment of like hell or something when you're standing before God, because you already have the blood of Christ that, that saves you from that. You don't have to answer for every single one of your sins, because what are you going to say? Yeah, I was stupid, God, I was a sinner. So that's why I called on Jesus to save me, because I've done all kinds of stupid things. He's not going to be just requiring every stupid thing that you've ever done, every sin that you've ever committed, and just throwing it back in your face after your flesh is already gone. But what he is going to do is say, okay, here's what you've done with your life. The foundation's already been laid. You, you got Jesus Christ. That's why he says that, that they, they um, will be saved Yet, you know, if all of your works are burned up, he says, yet he shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So you will still, I mean, you are still saved. Even if you've done nothing for Christ, you're still saved. But look at your own life. Honestly, what work have you put forth for Jesus Christ? If you were to stand before Christ today, think back on everything you've done. And if you were to put all this stuff up, how much would abide that fire? Is there more that you can do? If you have nothing as of today, well, hey, you know what? All you got to do is be able to move forward. Because that's, that's what we need to be able to do is just think, look ahead, say, you know what? Maybe I haven't done anything. Maybe all the things that we looked at today, things I could earn rewards from, I haven't done any of those things. There's, there's, there's probably going to be nothing laid up for me. Focus on those things now. How can you help others? The main way is by leading them to Christ. And then helping also to disciple that person and get them even closer and doing other good things for God. And then get those people working and doing, and doing their own things for God. You are multiplying the goodness when you can train other people to do the same thing. First you start off just being able to, to, to win another person to Christ. But then you can get to the point to where you can train other people to do the same thing. Then your works and efforts have expanded and multiplied greatly. And God will reward you for all of those things. God will reward you for the great work, for the works that you do for him. It's not in vain. So when, you, when the persecution comes because you start to do the works, you don't have to worry about that. Think about the, the treasure that you're laying up for yourself in heaven. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being so great and wonderful to us, dear God, that you don't owe us anything at all, but you've already said that you would give us rewards for the work that we do, dear God. I know that everyone here would be happy enough just with our salvation. This is truly an amazing gift. But you go above and beyond that by offering us rewards for doing work for you, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to consider what our life is, what we're doing with our life, dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us to be able to, to keep the right focus and to, to put forth the effort that will go into earning rewards of eternal value that we will have with us forever. The things that we can take with us. We can't take our money, our house, our boats, our cars, or any financial things, or clothing, or anything else, dear Lord, we can't take that with us when we die, but we can take these other rewards that will be with us for eternity. We can bring other people with us by getting their souls saved, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to stay focused on the most important things, on being a minister, on serving others, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.